Hi, everybody. Welcome to Monday morning on this uh, official work off holiday because Juneteenth was yesterday. What an eventful weekend. Holy cow. Man, oh man. And I'm not just talking about the festivities. Happy Juneteenth. Happy Father's Day. Happy birthday to me. That happened over the weekend. I'm one year older and hopefully wiser too. Um, but man, the market, the market this weekend was bonkers. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not totally upset about it because you can win either way when the market's going up and or going down. When it's going up, hey, guess what? The value of your purchasing power of your investment is going up. Um, when the value is, when the price is going down, congratulations, everything's on sale. Time to buy some sats, satoshis, the smallest unit of Bitcoin, if you're not familiar. Let's look at a few things, shall we? Dive in. This is a chart of what's called the Bitcoin dominance. The Bitcoin dominance is the entire cryptocurrency market cap and how much of that market capitalization is represented by Bitcoin itself. Uh, you'll see that Bitcoin dominance was climbing for a little bit for the past May, June, oh, the last couple of weeks at the very least, and then it dove in the last couple of days. I think that is going to be a short-lived dive. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to see an increasing Bitcoin dominance. And if we zoom out and look at the five year, as we moved into a bear market over more further and further into a bear market over the last uh, bull cycle, you'll see that Bitcoin dominance rose. And we're probably going to see that kind of behavior again, um, especially because when the market crashes, hey, when the market rallies, altcoins, to use the um, favorable term for them, they surge higher and faster than Bitcoin, higher as in multiples, right? They can go 500x, they can do crazy things where Bitcoin, because it is the market dominant player, requires more capital to move a similar percentage. So during a bull run, altcoins are hot, hot, hot. They're the big thing. But we just saw Terra Luna collapse. We saw Celsius hurt and die, including uh, its token sell. Now, sell in the last few days is seeing something of a short squeeze. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But the point is, when the market crash, crashes broadly, altcoins die harder than Bitcoin. People flee to the safe asset. And guess what the safe asset is in the cryptocurrency world? That's right. It's the famously volatile Bitcoin. So Bitcoin dominance, I think, has been going up recently. This rise right here, but it's dropped a little bit right there. That's fine. These things don't move in straight lines. I think we're going to see Bitcoin dominance continue to rise for the foreseeable future. Bitcoin is your safe bet, especially if you're holding it in self-custody and uh, you're not on exchanges because we've seen recently how dangerous that can be. Okay, says James Lavish. Lavish on Twitter. James is reformed hedge fund manager and ex-Yale hockey Cornell Fintech and Private Investments. He's a BTC guy. James says, okay, we're back over 20K and we all learned our lesson on using leverage in BTC, right? Right? If you didn't watch the market over the weekend, Bitcoin took a dive. Everything took a dive, but Bitcoin notably went below 18K for a minute there on Saturday. I happened to be at a movie with my kids and I didn't set a buy order, so I missed that low, low, low price. And hey, Maybe I wouldn't have gotten it anyway. I had certain price targets in mind that I was going to buy at, and I got within spitting distance. I got so close, but it didn't get there, so I didn't hit buy, and then it started to recover, and it was above 20K, and I was like, ah, the market's going to get away from me, so I bought. I, I deployed my dry powder. I put my cash back into Bitcoin, and uh, you know, maybe I didn't hit the bottom, 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 the absolute bottom. Right now... Bitcoin is at $20,614.94, according to the coin market cap widget on my phone. Um, Ethereum is up. Even my little favorite micro cap token, Giddy, is up. So we've, we've recovered a little bit. I bought Bitcoin probably at about this level uh, yesterday. Bit the bullet, bought it. And here's the thing. Did I buy it at the absolute bottom? Probably not. No, no, absolutely not. I know I didn't because it was lower than that on Saturday and I bought on Sunday. Uh, is it going to go lower again? 
well, maybe, maybe, maybe there's some huge macroeconomic shock that sends it further south, right? Goes back into the 17,000s or maybe the 15 or 16 or who knows? 12, I don't know. There, there are some technical analysts who have predicted that it will go very, very low. 12, 10, whatever. Sounds crazy, but you know, 20,000 sounded crazy not that long ago. The market defies expectations. James Lavish here is talking about the lessons we've learned with leverage. Don't trade with leverage. That's, um, that's setting yourself up for failure. You really have to know what you're doing if you're trading with leverage. Um, that's, that's a professional kind of thing. And it's tempting because you're like, hey, I can get rich. Or you can get wiped out. And if you really, really, really play with leverage, if, if you don't know exactly what you're doing, if you're not incredibly educated, you will get wiped out. So don't play with leverage. Um, moving on. Justin, 13,000 wallets bought one or more Bitcoin last week. Notably not this weekend, last week. So they also didn't get the absolute bottom. They got a low, but not the bottom, bottom, bottom. And that's too bad. But ultimately, is it going to matter? Is it going to make a huge difference to them? Um, that sounds maybe crazy and harsh. What do you mean it isn't not going to matter? We'll zoom out. Here's a, here's a post on Forbes from 10 years ago, 12, 11 years ago, from June 2011. So that's the end of Bitcoin then, says the article. The price was $17.51 when this was published. Uh, they were wrong. They were categorically wrong, right? It's not only dead, it has revived stronger than ever in the years that followed. And if you zoom out and look at the broad picture, we are below this gray line, the gray line representing basically the fair market value of Bitcoin, right? Averaging out uh, what the price has been with highs and lows. So this is a historic great buying opportunity. In the future, years from now, five, 10 years from now, and don't buy if you're not planning on holding for years. This is not a quick flip. But if you are planning on holding for years, imagine yourself five years from now, 10 years from now, are you going to be upset at yourself that you bought at 20K and not 18K? Is it going to make a huge difference to you? Or, or are you going to be so glad that you bought one of the strongest, most self-sovereign assets on planet Earth that nobody can confiscate from you if you hold it correctly in self-custody? I really need to make a video about that. I've had numerous people ask me personally, my parents, my siblings, my friends, how do I hold it in self-custody? Well, there are good tutorials out there, but I should make one for myself, for my friends and family and my viewers about how to do that. Expect that coming up. There are a bunch of videos I need to make. I've been doing a lot of these lives. I haven't done as many of my scripted videos lately. Every time Bitcoin dies, it rises from the ashes like a phoenix stronger than ever. This from Dennis Porter, CEO and co-founder at Satoshi Act Fund. Um, this is an entirely true. Every time Bitcoin dies, it rises from the ashes like a phoenix stronger than ever. And this is actually what got me interested in Bitcoin. Obviously, the properties of it as independent money, a new kind of money, were interesting to me when I learned about it years and years ago. But what really got me involved was that it, it, it appeared to be unkillable. It wouldn't die. This is a chat log between me and my buddy, Rob. Hey, Rob, if you're out there watching, from June, July 22nd, 2011. I asked him about Bitcoin mining. Hey, Rob, have you figured out Bitcoin mining? No, I haven't figured it out yet. I wish I could. It's a little too technical for me. Dang, yeah, me too. Gosh, I really want to get into mining. I think that would be cool. Um, but the price has already gone up from Rob. It may be easier now. That was at the very beginning of Bitcoin. Prices were like $1.20, me. I should have gotten in then. Oh, well, carpe diem. I guess we do it now, Rob. So it goes. This is me in 2011 lamenting that I missed the price surge. It had been at a buck 20. When I, when I had this chat, it was like 17 bucks. And it, had, it had already 10 x more than 10 x And I was like, dang, I missed the surge. Well, after a couple of years of watching Bitcoin, I'd seen it 
surge and fall and surge and fall. And, and that whole time, people declaring that Bitcoin was dead, that the opportunity was missed. But they seem to not be seeing the bigger picture, which was weird to me. Every time it died and leveled out, yeah, it was half of what its all-time high was in the, in the near previous future. But it was also dramatically higher than it had been months before that. So when it was dying, the price was going up in the macro picture. How is nobody seeing that? Well, the Bitcoin people did, right? The fans of Bitcoin did notice that. It was, it was the casual observers, the third parties who would glance at Bitcoin and then come back to whatever else they were doing. They didn't seem to notice that the price was actually rising over time. And every time it, the price crashed, it'd say, oh, Bitcoin's dead. And it's like, but you said that a year ago and the year before that. And the price now is dramatically higher. Does that sound like something that's dead? This chat log was from 2011. I really got involved in Bitcoin in 2013. It was, it was a couple of years of watching it, learning about it, and seeing that it was not going to die, that this was a Pandora's box of sorts, a good Pandora's box, right? You, you can't uninvent Bitcoin. It's been invented. Um, it does this thing that nothing else could. The internet had 140 million users in 1997. Bitcoin has 140 million users today. You are still early. This is what the internet looked like in 1997. Remember this internet? Maybe you guys are too young. Maybe some of my viewers don't remember this internet. I certainly do. 1997, I was in high school. Maybe junior high. I can't remember. Yeah, junior high. Look at that. Look how ancient and primitive that looks. Realize that that is the Bitcoin network and the Web3 network that we are working with today. Bitcoin maximalists will cringe at my use of the term Web3 because they don't like anything that could indicate broader crypto rather than Bitcoin. Guys, let's just take it easy. Let's not be Puritans about all of this. I don't think that that's healthy. In fact, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Dang, man. My OBS software is not showing me the comments. I really want to see comments. Hold on. Give me, give me 30 seconds to see if I can find the window that shows chat. There it is. I found it. All right. Moving on. This is from a technical analyst. Again, some Twitter and on. I do not know who this person is. But let's take a look at what they've said. Bitcoin is getting ready for a mega pump. The mathematical structure of Bitcoin is categorical. Don't know what that means at all, truly. That's word salad. The crypto market is about to enter into a new major bull cycle. All right, let's look at their chart. We are right here. Let's zoom in if we can. This is us right in the middle with that green arrow. And they are projecting that we are going to rise to these previous trend lines that cross over the previous highs. They're calling this the initialization phase of Bitcoin, the first couple of years maybe. Yeah, from 2010 to 2013 slash 14. And then we have these trend lines that they have drawn out with the bottom of the market and the top of the market. Now, if you haven't already noticed this, it's, it's worth taking in. Look at that trend line, the red line, the orange line on top. Notice how the previous two cycles, we basically touched the top of it. Um, with the 2014 cycle, we touched the orange line. With the 2018, 2017, 2018 cycle, we touched the red line. And then we zoom forward to now. Look at that yellow dot, that yellow arrow. That is when Bitcoin was rising. And that is when everyone, nearly everyone, Certainly people who'd been in the space for some time, myself included, thought we had near absolute certainty. We were sure, I was sure that we were going to six figures because that is exactly what had happened in the previous cycles. And they've charted this a little differently. They've got two straight line channels. Um, you can do a regression line, a curve that fits these, and it draws out to a six figure Bitcoin happening in 2021. I was near not near. I was certain. I was planning on it. I was betting on it. I had my money on that. Uh, and it didn't happen. And it probably didn't happen because so many people were planning on that, right? 
You need somebody else to buy at those higher prices. If you've saturated the market, if everybody has bought in at the lower price, then there's nowhere else to go but down. Let's take a moment to have a drink. A little morning beverage. I have uh, here my Spindrift Sparkling Water. Yep, grapefruit flavored. Good stuff. Good morning to y'all. All right, moving on. Um, but this person is calling basically bottom here. The previous bottom channel has us at the green line and the teal line. And they are saying from this point, about 19,000 when they made this, we should start to see a surge that will last through 2023 and into 2024 even. Um, so the remainder of this year, well into next year, and even into the next. So a two-year surge. Now, the question is, are we at, do you see this green arrow here where it says evolution? Are we at that point where we're going to essentially trend sideways in that channel where uh, we stay within the fair market value of Bitcoin? Or are we at something much closer to the, the parabolic rise? Are we closer to that rise through the middle, up through the top channel. Um, I would suggest that we are probably not going to see the parabolic rise in the immediate future. Now, as pointed out, we broke with historic trends with this yellow arrow. We did not reach the top of that channel like so many thought we would. So maybe these historic trends are not as valuable as we thought they were, right? For a couple reasons. One, there aren't that many data points. If, if we're moving in a four-year cycle, we've only had three at most, if you even want to count the first one. And uh, if a pattern is well-established and everybody knows it, it can invalidate itself. For a, for a market pattern to repeat, there have to be people who don't understand the pattern. Because if they do, well, it's game theory, man. You have to have other people do the thing that that you're taking advantage of. If everybody's planning to take advantage of everybody else and everybody does the same thing because everybody's operating on the same model, it's not going to happen. So is it going to go north immediately? Uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. Is it going to go, is the price going to go south further than it has in the absolute immediate future, the next hours, days, weeks? Eh, maybe we let go much, much, much further south. Gosh, who might, but that seems so hard to wrap my head around. 10K Bitcoin, 50% of what it's at now. Possible, I suppose. Um, that's not stopping me from buying at today's price because I don't know exactly what's going to happen. I just know that relative to historic prices, now is a pretty good price. Might go lower, but I'm not going to lose sleep over hitting the exact bottom. Because guess what? Nobody does, really and truly. If, if you hit the exact bottom, it's because you got lucky. Don't pat yourself on the back. Luck is not a virtue. Uh, the people who are consistently good at this kind of average themselves in. They don't, they, don't, they don't worry about being exactly right. They worry about being generally directionally right. So how can you be di directionally right? By... Uh, buy now, maybe have some cash still on hand if it goes lower and ride this out because the direction is clear. Over time, the direction is clear high and to the right. And the macroeconomic factors that make Bitcoin valuable in the first place have only intensified. Nothing has fundamentally changed about the Bitcoin network itself. Let's jump to the next thing. From Jeff Rose, founder and CEO of Valeshire Capital Management. Jeff Rose says, imagine having a stable, unchanging, disinflation monetary policy for the entire world. Imagine what humans could do if their gifts, skills, and dreams were unhindered by short-term thinking and unpredictable government fiat currency. Imagine a better world. You know, we are told that inflation is good, that a small amount of inflation is good. That's never really made sense to me. It's never sat right. Okay, if a little bit of inflation is good because money moves, then is a little bit of deflation good because money stays, because you save? 
nobody saves anymore. If you have inflationary currency, you are penalized for holding on to your money for, I don't know, a rainy day, bad economic circumstances, situation where you might want some cash on hand. Gosh, does that sound familiar? Do people right now wish they had some cash reserves on hand? So the arguments for a inflationary currency, I mean, you can make the opposite argument very easily, very easily. Uh, we, we have inflationary currency because if, if we had disinflationary currency, then people would hang on to their money. Is that such a bad thing for people to hang on to their money? I thought money was storing your purchasing power. I thought it was a battery for human energy, right? If you want to save for the future, for long distance in the future, maybe you should save. Well, with cash right now, boiling away, melting away, like cotton candy in the rain, you can't do that. I mean, I wish I had cash right now because the assets, all, all, all the other assets out there are, are incredibly volatile. I think they're volatile because we have inflationary monetary policies that are catching up with us because central planners insist on central planning. Anyway, Bitcoin is disinflationary. There's a book that I read a little while ago called The Price of Tomorrow. Let's take a look at that, shall we? The Price of Tomorrow by Jeff Booth. This is a, a really great book. I really enjoyed it. He did an interview with Scott Melker, the Wolf of All Streets, if you don't know him on Twitter. He did an interview with Scott Melker at the Bitcoin conference at the beginning of April. It was a great interview. I definitely recommend it. And I recommend the book. Jeff Booth, Booth makes a strong case for why inflationary monetary policy has an ugly end game and we are approaching that and there's nowhere else to go but collapse. Does that sound doomsday? It sure does. But he's saying if we had a disinflationary policy, if we had money that retained and even increased in value, we could see a lot of positive social outcomes with that. But nobody in the world does it. Bitcoin is maybe the only thing that does, the only money. I, I use quote fingers because some people debate whether Bitcoin is really money. Um, Bitcoin is the only money that does this. Okay, back to Jeff Booth. Jack, back to, uh, back to Jeff Ross, back to Twitter. Just in, Solana-based protocol Solend has voted to temporarily control the largest whales account to mitigate liquidation risks. Yikes, this happened yesterday, June 19th, uh, Juneteenth and Father's Day in the United States. Um, Solana is famously very centralized. It is not a decentralized network in the same way. It's fast. It's cheap. It's highly centralized. Everything is a trade-off. Everything comes at a price. So this is the price, right? Somebody, some whale out there has a lot of Solana and it's making everybody else nervous. So what are they going to do? They're just going to empty his account because you can do that when you have a centralized service. Um, yikes, man. I don't know who the whale is, but I would be regretting my involvement in Solana if people were saying, we're going to vote on liquidating your account. Jeez, jeez. You can't do that in Bitcoin, right? Um, there's a YouTube channel called Three Blue, One Brown, or maybe it's Three Brown, One Blue. Go ahead and Google either of those and you'll find it. And search for how how Bitcoin works. And this is a, a channel, this is a YouTube channel about mathematics, actually. And uh, I know mathematics is often characterized as a boring field, but this channel does a really good job of making it interesting and playing with it, toying with numbers. And when he explains how Bitcoin and cryptography work, he does a really great job of explaining the mind bending numbers involved in cryptography and how there is just no way it is it is impossible in every practical sense of that word to crack into a bitcoin wallet through simply guessing their private key it's not going to happen if every particle on earth was a supercomputer and every planet in the universe had the same qualities and you put all of those computers trying to guess this password then it would take 
millions of years. It's something mind-bending like that, where you're like, oh, okay. So it's not unlikely, it's impossible. Moving on. Oh, Michael Saylor. Would that we all had the conviction of Michael Saylor. If gold owners could seize another investor's gold assets, change the universal characteristics of the metal, or decide whether gold mining is allowed to continue, it would be a security, not a commodity. This is one of the things that Saylor goes on and on about, that Bitcoin had what he calls, and I like this phrase, and it's gained in popularity, an immaculate conception. It was the Pandora's box. It was created and developed thoroughly and became a decentralized network before people were trying to suck profits out of it and the other participants in the network. Uh, you can't recreate that. You can't do that again. This is why Bitcoin maximalists essentially say that Bitcoin is categorically different. It was the first one out of the gate. It was playing this game before people realized that it was a game to play. <coughs> um, it's like digital gold, but if gold was like Solana, like we just talked about, where another investor, uh, where owners could seize another investor's gold assets, change the universal characteristics of the metal, or decide whether gold mining is allowed to continue, it would be a security, not a commodity. He's saying that every other cryptocurrency besides Bitcoin is a security. There is a centralized body in charge. There is a founding group that pre-mined that are invested, there are VCs that are trying to get rich, that can change the rules arbitrarily at their decision. They can cast a vote and change them. But can't, can't people cast a vote and change in Bitcoin? Effectively, no. There are too many of them distributed around the world with disparate interests. They're not going to vote against their own interests, against the network's interests. You're, you're gonna have a very hard time persuading that body of people, that disparate body of people who don't know each other to coordinate their activities like you can very easily with a small group of people behind closed doors, face to face, deciding on what happens to a broad network of other people. It's not the same, categorically different. From Naval, Navalisms HQ, quotes from Naval Ravikant, the, uh, you know, patron saint of philosophy investment Twitter fortune cookie himself. If you aren't willing to be mocked, you'll never be able to lead. This is something I've struggled with. I, I don't like having uh, my views denigrated or called crazy. And I have let myself be dissuaded by that way too much. Like I said, I've been in the Bitcoin space for a long time. But I haven't invested nearly as hard as I should have either my time and energy or my monetary assets. Because I thought this was going to change the world, but nobody around me, very few people around me seemed to be encouraging of that idea. So I moved on. I did other things. It seemed to make practical sense. Well, practical choices have not served me so well. And the people who were irrational, who were impractical, who committed themselves to this early, they've done very well. And frankly, a similar thing is happening right now. <clears throat> you have impractical Bitcoin maximalists saying that you need to hold Bitcoin in self-custody and not on some other service, some third-party service where you're getting, I don't know, 6% interest annually. Well, that sounds impractical. Celsius Network has great security and uh, I can earn a little bit of money on my parked Bitcoin. What's the problem with that? Well, we just found out what the problem with that is. Uh, not your keys, not your cheese, not your coins. Seems impractical to have to educate yourself on crypto security and hold it yourself and not let anybody else touch it or access it, not to get that 6% or whatever it is interest annually. That's impractical. Well, the impractical people seem to be winning. I don't totally relish that, but it's just the reality we're looking at. This is funny. Never forget, in the picture of this dystopian orb eyeball, this is from... WorldCoin. Did you hear about WorldCoin? I hope so. If not, I have a video on the topic. That's right. You could go to my channel, search WorldCoin. This was something that got announced months and months ago, end of last year, I believe. A project from Sam Altman, former president of Y Combinator, and a lot of other people in the crypto space, including Sam Bankman-Fried, CEO of FTX, and I believe Mark Andreessen of Andreessen Horowitz, where they were, probably still are, making an altcoin that they were going to give to people around the world, but they wanted to make sure that 
you had to prove that you were a single individual and then you would get your allotment. How are they going to prove you were a single individual? They're going to scan your irises. So they're going to have a database, biometric data on every human being's eyeball across the globe. It just, if you get dystopian vibes from something, listen to that. Don't ignore the vibes, man. From Jamie W. Garcia, or maybe it's Jaime. I don't know. I don't know this person, but I like what they had to say. I reject how TradFi and crypto bros are characterizing Bitcoin maximalists. Maxis are not a monolith. There is a vast range of opinions. I'm losing my appetite for the moniker. However, generally, Maxis align on some key factors. The uh, This is Bitcoin toxic maximalist love. You're going to kick the crap out of other people and tell them that Bitcoin is the way, the only way, and everything else is garbage. He's saying that there is a range of opinions I don't think there actually is. Maximalism, by its very nature, is an absolutist view. It it doesn't allow for a lot of range. This is why I'm 90% maximalist. This is why I'm mostimalist. This is why I would like to use the phrase, I'm a Bitcoin supremacist. But boy, that that word is sure loaded with a lot of uh, baggage that I don't really want to be associated with. But let's see what Jamie or Jaime Garcia has to say. One. Bitcoin maximalists agree on self-custody. Get your Bitcoin off the exchanges and or third parties like DeFi and hold your keys. Don't trust. Verify. Proof of work. Mining of Bitcoin must take place as proof of work, period, full stop. Decentralization. The key differentiator of Bitcoin versus fiat and cryptos, air quotes, cryptos, is that it's decentralized and anyone can participate in the network as a user, node runner, developer of its open source code and or miner, all for relatively affordable fiat costs. Speaking of running a node, I am awaiting a handful of pieces to arrive at my house because I will be building a node on this channel in a live stream, hopefully very soon. I think those pieces are going to arrive this week. Fingers crossed. Number four, immutable, secure, and unconfiscatable because of its decentralized nature. It's an unhackable network that prevents double spend and confiscation of coins. No one can manipulate the finite supply of Bitcoin which in fiat is often the cause of debasement. Five, privacy. While the ledger is public, those who perform good privacy hygiene, those who perform good privacy hygiene practices benefit from superior privacy. Maxis also recognize the shortcomings of privacy in any network and KYC and push people to use best practices. Maxis do not invest in other cryptos. Hmm... Privacy. Privacy in Bitcoin is an interesting topic. I had friends and family asking me about this all weekend. We had numerous family gatherings. Father's Day, my birthday. Is Bitcoin private? Well, it's private if if you know how to use it properly. Um, If you have proper wallet hygiene. Uh, I think very few people do, actually, because it's not obvious how to have proper wallet hygiene. You need to generate new wallets frequently and not keep all your coin in one wallet. Um, That's another topic that I should probably make a video on. So many videos to make. Monero, for what it's worth, is fundamentally more private than Bitcoin in the architecture of how it's built. Every transaction is fundamentally private. Where Bitcoin is pseudonymous and can be private if you know how to do that properly. There's a difference here. So he talks about privacy and then he talks about maxis do not invest in other cryptos. Well, Monero is another crypto that in that regard, that fundamental regard of why we value Bitcoin, it's better at it. This is why I, I, I hesitate to call myself any kind of maximalist, even though I'm talking about Bitcoin all the time. Maxis are not bulls or bag pumpers, but realists and often accused of being bears. Before weighing in, Maxis often battle test their ideas on each other. For example, Max, for example, Maxis call six months ago for tempered actions and solvency because they saw the macroeconomic situation coming. Is that true? Can you point me to some examples of that, sir? Were maximalists calling for tempered actions six months ago? I, I don't think that's what I saw. I think I saw a lot of people very excited that it was about to go to six figures and holding on to hope even when it started to wane. 
Maxis are often the first ones to say, don't buy Bitcoin unless you do your own research first. They often encourage newbies to spend 100 hours learning Bitcoin before getting into it. I was talking to my sister about this, my oldest sister. And she said that she has not bought any Bitcoin despite my talking about it now for 10 years because she doesn't understand it and she doesn't want to buy something that she doesn't understand. To which I say, that's actually really good. Uh, you should educate yourself on Bitcoin because if you don't, even if you buy some Bitcoin, if you don't sufficiently educate yourself on what it is you're holding, then you're not going to have the fortitude to withstand these sharp drops. If you don't understand what it is you're holding and then suddenly the asset drops 70% in a matter of months, you're going to sell it. You're going to think it's dead. That's why we hear this over and over and over. Bitcoin is dead. Okay, well, this person clearly has not spent enough time wrapping their head around what this asset is. And they're probably looking at a linear chart because if you look at a logarithmic chart, it's just so obvious that it's not dead. <sighs> Number nine. Maxis promote solvency. Don't play with money you don't have. Don't jeopardize your day job and, and ability to generate fiat income. Don't gamble with putting food on your table and meeting your family obligations. Ten, Maxis will tell it like it is. They will not sugarcoat the truth and they will be honest even if it sounds toxic or unkind. There's probably more, maybe less. Maybe I got some wrong. The end. So that's his take on Bitcoin, Bitcoin Maxis. I... Uh, I don't love the term. I don't 100% agree with this stuff, but there it is. That is directionally correct. Somebody else talking about Bitcoin maxis. Again, this is a Twitter or not. I don't know this person, but interesting topic of conversation. Some people need toxicity like this. Whew, that's a phrase. Some people need toxicity. Wow. Let's be clear, toxicity isn't a method that works 100% of the time, but at this point, from my point of view, I firmly believe that toxicity, toxicity is a net positive for Bitcoin and therefore humanity. Wow. And they point out this exchange. Does anyone know a project that won't end in a rug pull, please? The response, Bitcoin, you dumb F. <sighs> Jeez, I don't think that is the way, you guys. I'm not sure you understand what tough love is. That's the phrase you're looking for. You think that toxicity equals tough love. Um, but toxicity is not love. It's just tough. It's ridiculing and putting down and mocking people for their lack of education or that they don't share the same perspective as you. I promise you, you're going you're gonna to find more converts with a little more inviting tone. Catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Something like that. Yeah, just why why can't you just say Bitcoin instead of Bitcoin, you dumb F? How is the toxicity helpful? How is that bringing people in or educating them? It doesn't matter if you're right, if you're also so off-putting that nobody wants to listen to you. It doesn't matter. You're taking the stance of like an authoritarian parent, but you're nobody's parent. You're doing this to the people around you. They don't want to listen to you. They have no obligation to listen to you. And you're not helping them listen to you by being toxic. Can you tell how conflicted I am? I 90% agree with the Bitcoin maximalists, but boy, I sure don't like the way they approach this, the, the tone. I, I bring up this tweet right here from Stacker Satoshi for one reason only, to make one comment. Breaking FTX and Sam Bankman-Fried allegedly bailed out massive crypto companies to limit this crypto crash. This is a tweet from yesterday. They have no source cited. This is just hearsay. I bring this up to say one thing. I literally have seen the opposite accusation here on Twitter, also from Twitter Anons, that Sam Bankman-Fried and FTX were liquidating. They were, they were manipulating the market to wash out people like Celsius Network. That They caused the crisis. They exacerbated the crisis. So this is just to say that um, be careful what you take in. In fact, that's the top response here is pushing back on them. Really? Most data suggests that SBF, FTX were a major part of the consortium that attacked Celsius Network and Celsians. Did they cause it or did they relieve it? Hard to say and really difficult to get facts because unless you know exactly how to parse the data and where to get that data, 
you're going to get different stories from different people. There's a lot of misinformation out there. Just be careful. That's all I'm saying. From Jason P. Lowry, U.S. Space Force, MIT 2023, U.S. National Defense Fellow Researcher, researching Bitcoin. From Jason Lowry, I am determined to convince top U.S. leaders that it is a national strategic priority for the U.S. to adopt Bitcoin ASAP. This will require some to attempt to orange pill the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Staff. Let me read that again. This will require someone to attempt to orange pill the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I will give it my best shot. I don't know if the Joint Chiefs of Staff are involved, but it is my personal pet theory. This is crazy conspiracy theory, right? I don't have any evidence for this other than the logic of it. I think the government is already stacking sats. Why? How? How? Do, why? What makes me think that? Well, um, why wouldn't they? Why would some government agency with uh, security clearances so they could keep things quiet, with black budget programs so they could keep it off books, why wouldn't they? Everybody is looking at the dollar and seeing inflation. Everybody is looking at the national instability that's happening. Everybody is looking at our gerontocracy with old old people in government who do not understand technology, who are pushing our monetary system to its absolute limit. Any student of history can see that we are not in a good place, historically speaking. Compare us to um, the fall of Rome or, I don't know, Weimar Germany. It's not good where we stand right now. So if you can, as a strategic priority for national defense, stockpile some Bitcoin, an independent asset that appears to be very robust in the face of volatility. <clears throat> yes, it's volatile, but as we pointed out, it refuses to die. It refuses to actually be killed. It's decentralized such that nobody, no centralized party, no government could single-handedly kill it. <clears throat> and suppose if you're in that government and you know that the government money is monopoly money, that it's made up, that it's added arbitrarily by a central body of people or by banks. Why wouldn't you spend your monopoly money on sound money? Why wouldn't you trade your paper for something more valuable? That's it. That's all I've got. That's the <clears throat> it's the logic of the thing that persuades me. That's why I think the U.S. government and other governments around the world are already putting Bitcoin away. They're just doing it quietly. And hopefully, I say hopefully, if I were them, I would be practicing proper wallet hygiene to do it in such a way that it wouldn't be easily trackable. We talked about wallet hygiene before. If you know what you're doing on Bitcoin, you can be relatively private. There are ways to do this so that you have a variety of different wallets with a variety of different balances and they don't look like they're coordinating. If I were a government, that's what I would do. But hey, I'm, I'm not in charge of the government. From Zach Vol, I tweet about Bitcoin mining and markets. Bitcoin isn't dead but the stock to flow scam absolutely is. I wouldn't call stock to flow a scam. I would say that it was incorrect and has now been proven incorrect. Stock to flow, if you were unaware, is a model that predicted the future price of Bitcoin and it appeared to hold up pretty strong for a while and now it appears to be breaking. This red line is falling outside of the accepted channel of stock to flow. We're seeing diminished returns uh, relative to what stock to flow predicted. Um, I thought stock to flow might be the thing, might be accurate. It's, it appears that it is not. I'm okay with that. There are other models out there. There's hyper Bitcoinization where we would instead see an S curve. Um, there, there are other models beyond that as well. A very, very smart friend of mine who has made a, an obscene amount of money investing very early in both Bitcoin and Ethereum. He was part of the presale. Uh, he told me like a year and a half ago, more than that, maybe two years ago, that the stock to flow model was not accurate. He said, it doesn't hold up to actual scrutiny. If you look at the logic of the thing, it doesn't make sense. Like superficially, the logic does that, you know, as, um, as more stock is released, let's see how it's really just a supply and demand thing. I'm not going to do a good job explaining it here, so I'm going to skip over it. But stock to flow is just a supply and demand. And it looks at how much is being mined and released into the ecosystem versus, versus how much actual demand there is. 
He's like, if you look at how much is being mined and released, it, it pales in comparison to other market forces like trading on exchanges. That's not what's driving the price is basically what my friend was saying. And it appears that he was right. So sorry, stock to flow. We'll find some other price prediction model. My model is Bitcoin is scarce and that's not changing and everything else is volatile and the world is getting <laughs> more unstable. So I will rely on this decentralized na network that has shown incredible robustness. That's my model. It doesn't involve a ton of numbers. Heidi from Block at Blockchain Chick, who also has a YouTube channel, Crypto Tips. When celebrities of legacy finance start saying Bitcoin is dead, that is when you know you are close to the bottom. I think she is subtweeting Jim Cramer, mad money. And again, people like to say Bitcoin is dead. It is not dead. Look at the big picture. Look at the log scale. We're still headed up in the long term. Buy and hold for years. This is a tweet thread from Lynn Alden on why Bitcoin is a long-term uh, player, why it works long-term, what the actual innovation was, what it accomplishes that other things could not. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but I encourage you to find it and read it. Lynn is a, a brilliant strategist, a uh, brilliant analyst, not strategist, analyst. She's a brilliant analyst and uh, one of the brightest minds in the space. I think pretty universally respected, except in this thread, actually, she gets some flack from, again, Bitcoin maxis because she's not maximalist enough. That guy who was saying that there are a variety, there's a range of views within the maximalist camp. I think you're kidding yourself, man. Maximalists are toxic even to each other. There's a lot of purity tests applied. The great Lynn Alden, a brilliant, a brilliant analyst, is not pure enough for some of the Bitcoin maximalists. I don't get it, man. I don't get it. You just want to elevate yourself above, the, above, above others. You want to be more pure than others. Bravo. Congratulations. You're not going to get a coalition of support that way. Similarly, here is an interview with Nick Carter with Anthony Pompliano. Now, Anthony Pompliano and Nick Carter are both bullish on Bitcoin, but I think they are different in that Pomp was bullish on lots of things. He had Do Kwan on his podcast. He had Alex Mashinsky on his podcast. He does softball interviews and uh, lets people push their alt cryptocurrency. And that kind of makes sense. Anthony Pompliano runs a fund that invested in a lot of these other cryptocurrencies. Um, and he stands to make money. None of us are escaping motivated cognition. We all have our biases given our positions in life. Um, Motivate, motivated cognition is when you are motivated to think a certain way because that thing will benefit you. <clears throat> you can kid yourself and tell yourself that you're an objective observer, but we're not. We're, we're motivated. All of us are. We all have motivated cognition. The best thing you can do is just acknowledge that. Don't, don't try to pretend that you're some kind of objective, purely rational creature outside of it all. You're not. Anthony Pompliano exhibits some motivated cognition, and he's promoted a lot of things that have proven to be not great. Nick Carter, on the other hand, I, I trust Nick a lot more. Nick is not fully in the position of being as motivated to promote other things as Anthony Pompliano. And if we're saying that Nick Carter is giving the most honest breakdown of Bitcoin you'll hear, then uh, I suspect, I haven't listened to this yet, but I suspect that it is a totally, as good as you can hope for, a fair, frank breakdown of our present grim circumstances. So I am looking forward to listening to this. I really like Nick Carter. He's one of a handful of characters in the space that I think has a grounded, realistic take. All right, folks. That's it. That's the morning. Hold strong. Keep buying. I did. Maybe it'll go lower. Maybe. I'm, I'm still buying. I'm a net buyer, folks. Um, but if it doesn't continue to go south and we are at the bottom, sit tight. Sit on your thumbs. Don't worry. Go live your life. Go for a hike. Spend time with your kids. Happy belated Father's Day. And uh, this eventually will turn around. Bitcoin's one of the few safe haven assets that exist. I was talking to my dad about this on Father's Day yesterday because he bought a bunch of Bitcoin, but he doesn't watch the price like I do. And then I asked him, like, what do you think the price is at? He's like, I don't know, 25000 It's like, ooh, lower. 20? Lower. <laughs> Went down as slow as 17 something. And he like, ugh, kind of reeled from that. But I, I then gave him a pep talk of like, listen, 
don't worry about this. Nothing has fundamentally changed. We're seeing a lot of macroeconomic volatility, and maybe we'll continue to see that for some time. But the fundamental case for Bitcoin, it, it hasn't, it's only strengthened. This is the only asset that has a retreat path that can escape the present system. And right, we've, we've integrated with the present system in a lot of different ways, and we're looking for ways to integrate even more with ETFs. But ultimately, what we want to happen, what you should do, what all people should do, is hold their Bitcoins in self-custody to understand why it's, it's so strong. Stocks can't retreat from the macroeconomic situation. Um, real estate can't really retreat, though holding real estate is probably a smart move. Bitcoin is the only thing that can be entirely self-sovereign, that runs on its own rails, independent of TradFi. Go read this thread by Lynn Alden. She explains the, so many of the fundamental strengths of Bitcoin. It's really great. All right, that's what I got today, team. We'll talk again soon. Leave your comments and questions down below. Things we should talk about in the sooner, uh, talk about soon in the future. We'll address it in.